Hello and welcome to Japan Media Tour. I'm your host, Stephen TM, and today we're going to talk about the legendary poet Matsuo Basho, his contribution to Japanese writing and culture, and how his ideas can help you live a fuller, happier, and healthier life. Basho was born Matsuo Kinsaku in 1644 in the city of Ueno, in what is now the western part of Mie Prefecture. But was at the time known as Iga Province. This area is famously associated with ninjas, also known as shinobi, as one of the two main ninjutsu schools was located in Iga. By the way, the word ninja, meaning one who is invisible, did not come into regular use until the 20th century, which is also the case with the word haiku, by the way, which we'll be talking about today. As that is the type of poetry Basho is most famous for. So, although there were some unfounded rumors out there, Basho was likely not trained in ninjutsu. He was, however, the descendant of a line of samurai. His family had lost status over the years, though, and most of his close relatives were now farmers. So, they were either low ranking samurai or high status farmers, depending on how you look at it. Though the exact date of his birth is unknown, he died in 1694 at the age of 49 or 50. And not much is really known of Basho's early childhood either.、Um, as a boy, he was a servant to a local noble named Todo Yoshitara, who was a relative of the local daimyo. Daimyo were like、uh, feudal lords who ruled over the provinces of Japan before the establishment. Of the prefectural system in the late 1800s. The daimyo themselves reported to the shogun, who was like a, a military dictator. Matsuo Basho lived in Ueno Castle with Todo Yoshitara, where the two bonded over their shared love of poetry and often collaborated on poems together. You see, Renku, or Haikai no Renga, was a popular type of collaborative poetry at the time. In which several poets would gather and take turns with coming up with、uh, different verses, sometimes up to a, a hundred verses, or maybe even over that, but a hundred was sort of like a, a mark that a lot of poets wanted to hit, just going back and forth with each other until they got to a hundred verses in the poem. So it was originally silly and, and vulgar, like comic riffing or something, or maybe like a, a rap cipher. But poets like Basho elevated it and eventually evolved into what is today known as haiku.、Uh, haiku were originally just part of the renku, but Basho was the one who separated the two and took haiku poetry to another level. So, haiku generally consist of three lines of five, seven, and five syllables. Haiku usually also contain three parts. Two images and one concluding line. They have a kigo or season word, something related to a particular season, whether it be snow, flowers, cicadas, fallen leaves, cherry blossoms, anything like that. I think I, I mention it every episode, but the seasons are so central to Japanese media and culture, it's, it's hard to get away from them. Uh, they, so, these haiku also tend to contain a poetic place. These are often references to significant locations or places with significant cultural or religious value, such as temples or shrines. And haiku are also usually separated by a kireji, which is a dash or other form of punctuation that divides the poem into two distinct parts. These parts can reinforce each other or juxtapose each other to increase the intensity of the feeling of the poem. The kiraji is said to bring closure to the ideas expressed in the poem. All right, so I threw a lot of technical language and information at you there just to get it out of the way, but let's actually look at some haiku. We can start with what is perhaps Basho's most famous haiku. And one that almost everyone in Japan would be familiar with. It's known as Old Pond. The Old Pond. A frog jumps in. Sound of water. 
it's so simple yet so evocative. And by the way, you may notice that it doesn't have the 575 syllable pattern that we just discussed, but that's just because it was translated into English. The original Japanese version is 575. Furuike ya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. So, how should we interpret this poem? Should we even try to analyze it, or are we better to just leave it untouched in its beautiful simplicity? Well, let, let me read it again. The old pond, a frog jumps in, sound of water. Although I think the power of this poem comes from the initial thoughts and feelings we have after we hear the concluding line, I'll share one interpretation that I've heard with you. Is it that the frog represents the external world, and the water, our mind? External stimuli have an effect on us in the short term, but after that, the ripples subside, and we're left only with our own internal monologue. This poem hits you with a moment of zen, and as soon as it does, it's gone again, symbolic of the transient nature of things. I've also heard scholars of Japanese poetry say that Old Pond was quite subversive at the time. So the concluding line is about the sound of water, right? But usually when poets would talk about the sound of water, people would expect a babbling brook or some fast-moving water like that, and they would expect the frog to be croaking to make its sound. But what Basho gives us is a different sound and atmosphere than what people would have expected at that time. Just the splash from the frog jumping into the pond. And I know that's really getting into the weeds there, but I just thought it was an interesting perspective that certain scholars have taken. But, you know, wh wherever your analysis takes you, it's clear that Basho was very revolutionary for his time. Consider that the Renku poetry that came before this was about things like getting drunk and pissing yourself. Haiku was clearly something else altogether, even if it had humble beginnings, just like Basho himself. So the death of Basho's young lord, Yoshitara, was said to be a pivotal moment that would forever change Basho's life. He moved from his hometown of Ueno to Kyoto, which was the capital of Japan until the Meiji Restoration in 1868, when the emperor declared Tokyo the new capital. This is also when Edo's name was first changed to Tokyo, by the way. I always found it confusing that Kyoto was the capital of Japan during the Edo period. It seems like Edo should have been the capital at that time. But nevertheless, Basho lived in Kyoto for a bit, uh, studying poetry under Kigin Kitamura, who was, I don't know, a bit of a legend of his day, I suppose. And he was mostly putting together anthologies for other writers, Basho was, and gaining a reputation as a pretty good poet himself. Um, but he stayed there for a time until eventually moving to the aforementioned Edo. While in Edo, he worked as a teacher, and this is when he was given the name Basho. You see, one of his students gifted him a banana tree, Basho, meaning banana tree in Japanese. He planted the banana tree outside of his modest hut, and it thrived. I guess people were quite impressed by it. I, I love the idea that this legendary poet's name is Banana Tree. Not to be confused with the current day Japanese comedic duo, Banana Man. But before this, Basho had several different pen names. Changing one's name was common at that time, as we discussed in our episode on the ukiyo-e artist Hokusai. And by the way, Hokusai also lived in very humble shacks or huts and often moved from place to place, just like Basho. So there were a lot of similarities between the two Edo-era legends, although Hokusai wouldn't be born for another hundred years or so after Basho. One of the great themes of Basho's work and of the Edo era in general was the impermanence of things. As we've seen, even names were impermanent at that time. This all falls under the umbrella of wabi-sabi. Now, we've all heard of wabi-sabi, but let's break it down into its component parts. 
Wabi refers to a satisfaction with simplicity and austerity. Again, think of the hut Basho lived in. Sabi is an appreciation of the imperfect. There is also the idea that things become more beautiful as they age, and that there's beauty in melancholy. I remember I once had an English professor who said that you should never give a potted plant to your significant other, as it's far more beautiful to give them a cut flower that will quickly wither and die. Now keep in mind that he was teaching Gothic horror, but I think that there is some truth in what he said, and that truth can certainly be applied to the definition of wabi-sabi that we're working towards. There's beauty in fragility, impermanence, subtlety, and individuality. I find that individuality part especially intriguing within the context of Japan, as Japan is often called a collectivist country, and when speaking to a lot of my Japanese friends, they'll say things like, Japanese society tries to stamp out any individuality that one shows, especially in school or at the office. Now, I don't know how true that is. I don't have as much first-hand experience, but I've, I've seen it a little bit. But anyway, go, go walk around Harajuku for a bit, and then we can talk about individuality. However, I think the individuality in wabi-sabi refers to the more natural aspects that make things different. Um, imperfections, like a tree missing a couple branches, or Cindy Crawford's mole, something like that. There's got to be an updated reference there, by the way. I don't know. Who's got a mole these days? Anyway, what I want to say is that it's about the idea that difference should be celebrated, but that no one should strive to be a hero that's greater than anyone else. It's the idea that we're all one with nature. Very Zen, right? And wabi-sabi originally comes from Buddhism, so that makes sense. And wabi actually originally referred to the misery and loneliness of living in nature away from other people, but it shifted over time to refer to the peace and appreciation for being alone in nature. Okay, so we had a nice little idea of what wabi-sabi was, and then I went and ruined it and created a bunch of dissonance. Uh, But it's perhaps best to use examples anyway, rather than strict definitions in order to fully understand the concept of wabi-sabi. So yeah, you can forget everything I just told you and we'll go into one example that's often cited as a perfect representation of wabi-sabi. And this is the art of kintsugi. This is when pottery is repaired with lacquer mixed with gold powder. They also use other mineral powders sometimes, like silver or platinum, but most people think of gold when they hear the word kintsugi, especially since the word kin means gold. But the point is, instead of hiding the cracks, you're accentuating them with beautiful golden lines. If that isn't an appreciation for the imperfect, then I don't know what is. Well, maybe nature is. Picture you're walking through the forest, maybe on the island of Yakushima in southwestern Japan. This island, by the way, was the inspiration for the setting of the 1997 Ghibli movie, Princess Mononoke. So if you've seen that, you can picture the forest I'm talking about. So along the path, you see moss-covered rocks, Up ahead, there's an old pond with a decaying tree stump sticking out. Maybe that frog from Basho's poem jumps off and makes a little splash. There's a felled tree blocking your path, so you need to find an alternate route in order to continue your hike toward the shrine you've traveled so far to visit. This is wabi-sabi in the way that our friend Matsuo Basho experienced it. He loved nature and often went on trips or pilgrimages through forests, small post towns, and over mountains, stopping at shrines and temples along the way, and always writing haiku as he went. It was said that he dressed as a beggar when he went on these journeys, even though he was famous in metropolitan areas like Edo. The records of a weather-exposed skeleton was his first travel essay, which detailed his journey west from Tokyo, then Edo, to Kyoto and Nara, 
I mostly wanted to mention this just because it's an incredible title. There are various different translations of the title, but I like that one, The Records of a Weather-Exposed Skeleton. And it's in line with how he described himself, too, as a wind-swept spirit, which conjures up thoughts of a tree on a cliffside, its leaves torn off by a gale. So the narrow road to the deep north, or Oku no Hosomichi, is a collection of Basho's travel essays written around 1682, while on his five-month journey north from Edo, visiting beautiful and poetic places along the way. This is probably his most famous work. Basho's northern journey went from Edo to Sendai, up to Iwate, then over to the west coast, and back down to Ogaki in Gifu Prefecture. It would be pretty cool to follow his route today, and there are some tourists who, who do that. Northern Japan wasn't that much of a tourist destination in his time, and it still isn't really today, although it has been gaining a bit of popularity more recently, but not even close to the beaten down paths of Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. Basho's narrow road inspired a new style of writing called haibun. This is a, a combination of prose and poetry documenting a journey, with the prose adding context to the haiku. The imagery of haibun follows two paths, all the external things that are observed along the way and the internal images that go through one's mind over the course of their journey. He wasn't alone on his trip to northern Japan. He traveled with his companion Sora, who was a student of his, each of them writing poetry as they went. And travel... Travel at that time was very dangerous, and a lot of people assumed that sooner or later he wouldn't make it back from one of his journeys, but he always did, despite the highwaymen lurking along the routes. So let's have a little look at an excerpt from The Narrow Road. Mending my cotton pants, sewing a new strap on my bamboo hat, I daydreamed rubbing moxa into my legs to strengthen them. I dreamed a bright moon rising over Matsushima, so I placed my house in another's hands and moved to my patron Mr. Sampu's summer house in preparation for my journey, and I left a verse by the door. Even this grass hut may be transformed into a doll's house. This was taken from the beginning of the text, and you can see that he's talking about one of the modest little cottages he lived in. And by the way, there's a bunch of different translations, so if, if you search up the narrow road and don't find this exact translation in there, there's a whole bunch of them, but almost all of them have the final line, uh, including Doll's House, in there. So... As always, there's many different interpretations as well, but what he seems to be saying about the grass hut is that it's up to the owner to make of the house what they will. Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and it's all about your mindset. The simple grass hut can be made beautiful, less likely through someone making tangible changes to it, and more likely in one's own mind. One must find happiness in the simplicity of the hut. That might be a good slogan for Pizza Hut, actually. Although they never really do anything simple, do they? Recently they released a, a ramen pizza in Japan. It doesn't look very good to me, but it, I mean, it's probably fine. How, how bad could it be? It has noodles on it and some sort of thick gravy meant to mimic ramen broth. Looks, I don't know, it doesn't look that good. But anyway, let's reel things in a bit here and talk about the origins of haiku, even before the comedic stylings of the Renku poets in the early Edo period. Before that, there was waka poetry, which dates back to the Heian period, and actually even before that. So the Heian period, by the way, lasted from 794 to 1185, and at that time, people were obsessed with aesthetics. Two key concepts arose at this time. Miyabi, which referred to all things elegant and refined, 
a loathing of all things vulgar or absurd, and mono no aware, which we actually talked about in a previous episode. Mono no aware is a sensitivity to nature, uh, the idea that nature can make us become emotional. It's similar to wabi-sabi, and mono no aware also expresses a sense of beauty in the impermanence of things. Um, in order for someone or something to be beautiful in Heian, Japan, they needed to exhibit both miyabi and mono no aware. So with those two ideas in mind, it's natural that Heian, Japan was a golden age of romantic poetry. There's a nice connection between this and the idea of courtly love being explored half a world away in medieval Europe. All right, so now that we have a bit of a feel for Heian Japan, let's see what waka poetry was all about. The Kojiki, the oldest known Japanese text, compiled in the year 712 CE, well before the beginning of the Heian, actually contained poems written in waka style. The Kojiki, by the way, is fascinating. It's a semi-historical chronicle of myths and legends in Japan, you know, you know those old chronicles that we've all heard of in uh, Greek mythology or something? It's the Japanese version of one of those, essentially, which are always full of really cool stuff. Um, it's actually the basis for a lot of Shinto rituals that are still performed to this day. So Waka originally encompassed several different types of poetry, but eventually came to refer to those with a form of five lines of five, seven, five, seven, and seven syllables for a total of 31. There were many different varieties of waka, but romance was one of the core topics, especially in Heian, Japan. The word waka simply translates to Japanese poetry. This is because they wanted to differentiate it from Chinese poetry, which was really popular at that time. In fact, often when you see that wa at the beginning of a word, it's referring to something Japanese. For example, washoku means Japanese food. We'll talk more about waka in a future episode, but the important point here is that it laid the groundwork for haiku, which would appear a few hundred years later in the Edo period. There are actually a lot of similarities between the Heian and Edo periods. Both were peaceful, with the word heian actually meaning peace in Japanese. And while Heian Japan saw the gradual decline in Chinese influence, the Edo period was strictly isolationist, so the decline of all sorts of influence at that time. Um, all these ingredients led to both eras being perfect for creating uniquely Japanese art forms. And now there was one ingredient that made the Edo era special, our old friend the printing press. So mass printing had been introduced to Japan by Christians who came from Europe in the late 16th century. Just in time, too, as Christians face a lot of persecution around this time and were forced to go underground lest they face serious repercussions, often including execution. Not to mention Japan would soon after close its borders to all Europeans and to everyone else for that matter. Nevertheless, the introduction of mass printing had the same effect it had everywhere else in the world. It led to increased access to books and poems, which in turn caused an increase in literacy. Similar to how the introduction of woodblock printing techniques, originally from China, would eventually lead to the democratization of art in Japan. So there were two main types of literature in the Edo era. Ga which was the really high-class stuff about the beauty and the majesty of nature, and zoku, which was made for the common people. It was vulgar and comedic, things nobles in Heian, Japan, would have absolutely despised. Anyway, these two types of literature mirrored the two dominant art forms in Edo, Japan. There was, of course, ukiyo-e, woodblock printing, and there was the more traditional Japanese painting influenced by the legendary artist Tanyu Kano, among others. If ukiyo-e was a reaction to the traditional paintings enjoyed by Japan's nobility, then zoku was a reaction to Japan's classical poetry. 
And what made Matsuo Basho special was that he was able to combine these two styles, perhaps making a more elevated variety of art accessible to the common people. It was art that everyone could enjoy, just as our man Hokusai would end up doing with his woodblock prints later on. Both men were very fond of travel and had a hand in popularizing domestic travel in Japan during the age of Japanese isolationism. Basho was somewhat of a legend by the time Hokusai came around, with Hokusai himself even making portraits of the poet. Basho also made some paintings in his day that were meant to accompany his poetry, providing some context and setting the scene a little bit. He was mostly self-taught, and painting was by no means his forte. Not to say that he was bad, he was pretty good, but he wasn't Hokusai. The fact he wasn't some incredibly great painter, though, actually fit with the theme of Karumi, found in many of his works, especially his later works. Sorry, I've thrown so many terms at you today, but that's how it is when you're looking at poetry from hundreds of years ago. So, Karumi is a type of lightness, or even childishness, which is sometimes used in haiku that connects it to the Renku tradition, as I mentioned earlier in this episode. So, now let's take a look at some more of Basho's haiku. I feel like we haven't gotten enough of that. So, I'll read a few back-to-back, and you can take a moment to consider each one as we go. I'm not going to break them down or anything, but yeah, here we go. Solitary now, standing amidst the blossoms, is a cypress tree. That soon they will die is unknown to the chirping cicadas. In the fish shop, the gums of the old sea bream are cold. Watching the cormorant fishing boats, in time, I was full of sorrow. Don't these poems just create an instant snapshot in your mind of where he was and what he was feeling? He's as much a photographer as he is a poet. Eventually, I'll do some episodes on Japanese photography, and we can think more about the connection between photo and haiku, especially nature photography, I think. But just think about the fact that while we travel these days, we like to take as many photos as we can to capture certain moments that we want to reflect on later, where Basho was essentially doing the same thing, but writing three-line poems. All is one, we're part of nature, and poetry and photography are the same thing. When you read Basho's poetry, I'm sure you can feel that beautiful melancholy, that empathy for nature, as we are part of nature. And in the West, we tend to be more individualistic, wanting to stand out and be special, but Basho wanted us to feel at one with nature, and his poetry is powerful enough to make us feel that way, perhaps back in our natural state, the way we're supposed to be. Notice that haiku are also exceedingly simple, very zen and meditative. Now, let's read a few more of Basho's works. On a darkening sea, the voices of wild ducks are faint and white. The sweet spring night of cherry blossom viewing has ended. Clouds now and then give rest to people viewing the moon. The rough sea extending towards Sado Isle, the Milky Way. I could honestly read these all day. They, they just hit so hard. I, I grew up listening to a lot of rap music, and Basho goes just as hard as anyone, really. Where Basho really separates himself from modern rappers, though, is his belief that poets should empty their minds of all things superficial. Don't think about money or possessions or any of that stuff. Those are only weights that hold you down from achieving enlightenment and being one with the natural world. Sorry, it's a bit cheesy, or maybe really cheesy, comparing this Edo-era poet to modern rappers, but I had to do it. It was right there for me. So, you see him talking about cherry blossoms a lot in his poems. Um, These are, of course, emblematic of the spring season, and also a great representation of wabi-sabi, They're in full bloom for only a short time, and then they're gone. I think it's beautiful that Japan still has an obsession with cherry blossoms, 
all these years later. They even have seasonal forecasts to let people know when and where to view the sakura. So Basho himself only lived to be 49 or 50 years old. Not necessarily young for his time, but he certainly didn't live to a ripe old age. It's said that he died peacefully of a stomach illness while surrounded by his pupils in Osaka. He never wrote a formal death poem, as was a custom of many Japanese poets, but he does have one that is often considered to be his farewell to this world. Although I've seen this debated quite a bit, but I'd say the majority of what I saw said that this would have been his farewell poem. Falling sick on a journey, my dream goes wandering on a withered field. The Japanese version of this actually implies that he's no longer able to run around freely, and at this point, he can only do so in his dreams. Yeah, some of them have quite a bit of difference between the original Japanese and the English translation, which is to be expected, but I think they're, they're all beautiful either way. So, you know, that's, that's it for our little episode on the windswept spirit Matsuo Basho. I hope it encourages you to unplug for a bit and maybe get out into nature. Maybe take some photos or just close your eyes and listen to the birds or something. Once in a while, it's good to just get out there and cleanse your soul a little bit, the way that Basho did. And, you know, this was one of my favorite episodes to research as I feel like I learned so much about Japanese history and poetry and about myself and the things I actually care about in life. Um, I really feel refreshed by this study of Basho. And I guess the final message is just to think about what you really care about in life and focus your attention in that direction rather than getting caught up in superficial things that don't really matter at the end of the day. So, as usual, I'm now going to bring things back to the modern day a little bit, and I've got a nice travel recommendation for you, inspired, of course, by Basho. All right, so before we get to the recommendation, I mentioned briefly... And as I'm sure you already know, Japanese people love cherry blossoms, or sakura, and they love going to cherry blossom viewing parties called hanami in the spring. Um, depending on where you are in Japan, hanami take place sometime between March and May, or much earlier if you're in Okinawa or something, it might be like uh, January. Um, but the blossoms themselves only last a week or two depending on weather conditions. So you need to take advantage of the opportunity and go see the sakura while you can. Hanami can, of course, take place anywhere cherry trees are found, but most cities will have one or two large parks with high concentrations of sakura. And there you'll likely find some food trucks uh, serving things like yakisoba, takoyaki, maybe some sweet potatoes and other street foods. And the festivities often carry on late into the night, with the cherry blossoms being illuminated by lights. This is really beautiful too, though the parties can get a little wild at this time, for better or for worse. If you, if you go there in the morning, the day after, there's probably cans and tarps all over the place. Or at least at the end of the night, there will be. They might have it cleaned by the morning. But anyway, some parks don't really allow these blue tarps, because, you know... It's unfortunate. A lot of people bring large blue tarps to put on the ground, which kind of takes away from the beauty of the cherry blossoms a bit. It is good, though, because then you could sit on the ground and chill underneath the cherry blossoms, which is awesome. And you don't really notice it after a while, but just when you're walking by the park or something, it might take a little bit away from the scenery. So yeah, some parks don't allow that, and they'll even build like some temporary benches or something for visitors and some of these look really nice you just sit there and enjoy the festivities actually one of the best days i had in japan was at a hanami uh chilling with some friends under the cherry blossoms and just enjoying a couple beers and some nice snacks and you know in the springtime a lot of companies come out with sakura flavored treats which in general are pretty good 
Um, so you can grab a few Sakura flavored Kit Kat or something like that and eat it amongst its namesake. Uh, the tradition of cherry blossom viewing actually dates back to at least the Heian period and perhaps even the Nara period, which preceded it, lasting from 710 to 794 CE. And the word Hanami was even used in the tale of Genji, which is a classical work of Japanese literature studied by every single Japanese student, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Hanami also happened to coincide with the beginning of the school year. So it's considered a time of change and a time for a fresh start in Japan. And there's something magical about it. And you can feel that type of energy in the air. Uh, one of the best parts in my mind is the Sakura Hubuki or Hana Hubuki, which it's like uh, when the cherry blossoms fall off the trees and float gently down to the earth, maybe landing in your hair or something. It, it feels like the kami are all around you. So if you happen to be in Japan at the right time, I highly recommend you go to the park for some cherry blossom viewing. All right, so for today's recommendation, I'm going to send you on a pilgrimage to the north of Japan. You can take the train, though. Even the Shinkansen bullet train will get you pretty close to where you need to go. Uh, so one of the temples Matsuo Basho stopped at during his journey north from Edo was Rishakuji, also known as Yamadera, or Mountain Temple. It's just outside of Yamagata City and not too far from Sendai. It's a really beautiful temple positioned on the side of a rocky forest cliff. The temple itself was built in the year 860. That's another point for the Heian period, if you're keeping track. The temple has actually been burned down and rebuilt multiple times, um, as a lot of temples have across Japan. Uh, when Basho went there, he wrote a famous haiku, which reads, Ah, this silence. Sinking into the rocks, the voice of cicadas. So that should give you a pretty good idea about what kind of place it is, right? Um, I suppose if you want to experience it the way that Basho described, then you should go in the summer uh, to listen to the cicadas. But it's also very beautiful in the fall when you can see the leaves changing color um, from up on top of the mountain. Look around and and just see all the beautiful colors of the forest. Uh, there's also a memorial museum for Basho, not far from there, in case you want to learn more about the poet. Um, I should mention that there are over 1,000 steps to climb in order to get up to the temple, and as it is, it's on the side of the mountain, so that's to be expected, right? And there's also a small entrance fee, it says online that it's about 300 yen, but uh, the price is subject to change, I suppose. Um, so that's it for everything today. Um, I really hope you enjoyed learning about Matsuo Basho. I know I did. Uh, next time, we're back in the cinema to enter the world of Japanese horror for the first time and discuss Kiyoshi Kurosawa's 1997 film, Cure. It's a really thought-provoking movie and definitely not your average slasher horror flick or something like that. You'll, you'll get a lot out of this one, I promise. So, until then, this is Stephen TM signing off, and I'll see you next time for Cure. Cure.